Um, so first thing is to welcome Fiona and say a huge uh, thank you uh, to you, um, Fiona, for joining us. In the second uh, of our sort of resurrected online <laughs> Barnes Philosophy Club uh, meeting. So uh, I hope you're all having a relatively happy new year in the circumstances. I think it's the best that uh, we can hope for at the moment. And um, I've been very grateful for all the messages of encouragement and, and thanks uh, to me and to Barbie for sort of getting the show uh, somewhat back on the road. Uh, and we have an emerging theme uh, for this season, which is, uh, I suppose, sources of ethical and moral inspiration uh, to be found in the world around us. And what's more <laughs> topical theme uh, could there be? Um, so we heard last time from uh, Sophie Grace Chapel on epiphanies. And you might remember one of the epiphanies was uh, a kestrel appearing outside um, actually Iris Murdoch's uh, window and distracting her from the uh, embarrassments of, of everyday life uh, and indicating some kind of higher purpose. So that was an entirely uh, unintentional uh, link between the last talk uh, and this one because that uh, was taken from uh, Iris Murdoch's uh, series of essays, The Sovereignty of Good, the Sovereignty of Good, which um, is uh, something that Fiona is going to be uh, building on. And um, Fiona, Professor Ellis, uh, is a Director of the Centre for Philosophy of Religion at Roehampton University uh, and has a wide variety of research interests, philosophy, theology, idealism, naturalism. Um, so uh, a great connection to our, our current uh, season and, and theme at the moment and Fiona is going to talk to us about a form of naturalism that builds on Iris Murdoch's true naturalism um, and outline a way in which that might be compatible with a belief in God uh, which sounds sort of paradoxical uh, and as I understand it from from the essay uh, the idea is uh, you know at a basic level that goodness and or God is to be found in the, the nature and purpose of the world as we perhaps somewhat dimly uh, perceive it. Um, so Fiona will explain at, at more length and more eloquently than that. Uh, and we'll ask you to talk to us until roughly 10 past eight. Uh, and then we'll have a discussion for about um, half an hour. Uh, so as we get towards 10 past eight, please post something in the chat if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, ideally, the question itself, if you can manage to type it out or just indicate that you'd like to ask a question um, if, that's, if, it, if it's a little bit long. Uh, although, as ever, I'd encourage you to keep it brief and I will chair and call on you to ask the question or if technology is failing us, uh, someone like, like me or someone else will ask the question on your behalf. So I will stop there. And uh, thanks once again, Fiona, for joining us and over to you. Thank you, Nick. Um, so I've got this paper here that some of you have looked at and it may well be a bit too long for this session and I don't want to end up talking about too much. So I think at an appropriate point, I could easily just stop and that would be sufficient to give us a really interesting discussion. And I'm not going to read the paper off the screen, which is how I think quite a lot of people do Zoom these days to make it look as if the person's looking at everybody. But I really need to literally look at everybody, otherwise it all feels a bit solipsistic and I forget what I'm doing. So I've got the paper here. And I'll do this in the way that I do it if I was with you. Um, so I'll sometimes be looking down at the paper and quite often I'll be looking at you to see that you're still <laughs> engaging with, with what I'm saying. So the first thing that I want to say by way of introduction is that most analytic philosophers are naturalists and atheists. And 
they accept that one must be a naturalist and atheist because they define naturalism as a form of anti-supernaturalism, where anti, where supernaturalism involves a commitment to a whole load of really spooky entities like platonic forms or God or gods or angels, um, the sorts of things that no right-minded analytic naturalistic philosopher could take seriously. Now, I want to destabilize some of the distinctions and positions that are taken for granted in this debate. And I did it in book form in my 2014 book, God, Value and Nature. Um, I want to destabilize the distinction between naturalism and supernaturalism and the natural and the supernatural, I want to say that this distinction is really unclear and there are different ways of understanding it. I also want to destabilize the distinction between the imminent and the transcendent. And I want to say that these terms are a lot more complex and problematic than a lot of atheists and a lot of philosophers of religion seem to assume. So I'm trying to get clear about some distinctions that are not remotely clear. And I want to say that a lot of philosophers have committed to a certain way of thinking about these distinctions, the natural, the supernatural, the imminent and the transcendent, in ways that I find to be quite problematic and unsatisfactory. So I've got a couple of opponents. One kind of opponent is the atheist who will say that I'm kind of talking nonsense and buying back into the spooky sort of position that as a philosopher, I should really be dispensing with. You know, they'll say that what I'm trying to do is not intellectually respectable. And I want to try and respond to that objection. My other opponent is the kind of philosopher of religion who again thinks that what I'm doing is not possible. The kind of person who thinks that naturalism and theism are logically incompatible and that we're really clear about the distinction between the imminent and the transcendent and that if you're a naturalist you're an immanentist and if you're an immanentist that excludes God. So they're my opponents, the atheist and the philosopher of religion and then I've got some allies and one ally is Plato, because I take his position pretty seriously. Um, another ally is the kind of theologian who is and has been for a long time saying the sorts of things that I'm saying. So, you know, from the point of view of many theologians, I don't think what I was saying is that shocking or even that original. Um, I'm thinking of theologians like John Robinson in his 1963 book, Honest to God, and Paul Tillich and um, Henri de Lubac. So a lot of theologians would accept what I'm saying quite easily. And my other ally, of course, is Iris Murdoch. And she was communicating with a lot of theologians and discoursing with them. For her, the distinction between God and good is not absolute in the way that it's not absolute for many theologians. So that's really by way of introduction. And I feel as though I'm talking too much and I probably won't get past page two of my paper but I hope that what I've said so far is remotely clear I've said I'm wanting to destabilize some distinctions I'm wanting to say so that from the point of view of many people is absurd and quite shocking and perhaps not even intellectually respectable and I've got some allies as well um, like Plato some theologians Iris Murdoch people like that so is, is all of that relatively clear at, at, as far as it goes? Okay. So what I want to do next is to begin looking at the paper that some of you've read, um, starting at section two, where I spell out what I mean by expansive naturalism, which is the kind of naturalism that I argue for in the book, God, Value and Nature. So the naturalist and the naturalist that I've discussed already denies that there's anything beyond nature. And he thinks that if you're a supernaturalist, 
you've got to deny that. You've got to postulate a second supernatural realm. And basically, I want to reject this dualistic framework and say that you don't have to postulate a second supernatural realm. Anyway, the naturalists will say there's only one world. We don't need another world. And that's supposed to be an implicit, implicit attack on um, religious types. So it's common enough refrain that this world, the world in which we live and move and have our being, is the only world there is. There's no need to postulate another world. Now, there's a question of how this world, the only world there is, is to be characterized. And a standard move amongst naturalists has been to characterize it in exclusively scientific terms. That is to say that there's no more to reality than what can be comprehended scientifically. And of course, you have to acknowledge that science isn't just any one thing. And there's a really difficult question of what counts as science and how we're to understand the distinction between the different kinds of science. The most important point for my purposes is that this kind of restriction to um, where the natural world is comprehended in exclusively scientific terms, where that rules out the possibility of comprehending it in non-scientific ways. That kind of position is deeply problematic. It involves a commitment to scientism. And as John McDowell has put it, an analytic philosopher you may have come across, scientism is a superstition. And he says we should discourage this dazzlement by science, which leads us to suppose that genuine truth is restricted to what can be validated by the methods of science. Now, it should go without saying that this is not a rejection of science. You know, everybody has to accept that science is a really important way of understanding reality. The point is simply that it's not the only way of understanding it. Now, McDowell defends a form of naturalism which takes us beyond scientism or scientific naturalism. And he's indebted to Iris Murdoch's true natu naturalism. The true naturalist, she tells us, is one who believes that as moral beings, we are immersed in a reality that transcends us and that moral progress consists in awareness of this reality and submission to its purposes. So the true naturalist is a moral realist, and there's commitment here to the idea that there's an external source of, of value. The relevant values make normative demands upon us, and we're capable of responding to these um, demands. This is not to deny that there can be error and ignorance, and Murdoch talks of the slowness of moral change, and quote, the infinite difficulty of the task of apprehending a magnetic but inexhaustible reality. She refers in this context to the clear vision that comes from imagination, effort and attention. A vision, she says, in which the will becomes a matter of obedience and reality is revealed to the patient eye of love. Her aim is to articulate a moral philosophy in which the concept of love can once again be made central. And she talks here of an ideal limit of love or knowledge which always recedes. So th this is Iris Murdoch's true naturalism. We can talk a bit more about what it really involves a bit later. Um, the first thing that you might think though, or that my typical naturalist would think is that this is way too spooky for contemporary naturalistic ears or sensibilities. For even if we can see that there's more to the natural world than what can be comprehended by science, it seems, you might say, quite problematic to suppose that reality is magnetic and has this kind of inexhaustible nature, which is how she describes it. Now, Murdoch herself, is a card-carrying Platonist. And the typical naturalist is anti-Platonist because, as I said at the beginning, he's anti-supernaturalist. 
So, you know, he thinks that the Platonist is one more kind of philosopher who postulates a second supernatural realm, but the naturalist dispenses, dispenses with all of that. Now, these worries are not as devastating as they might first appear, and I think that it's quite easy to, to dispel them. You know, the idea that moral reality is magnetic is just a fancy way of saying that we're attracted to it. We're attracted to the values that in a moral context we feel motivated to promote. So, I mean, that's one way of getting over the difficulty of Murdoch's description or the supposed difficulty of the description that moral reality is magnetic. And as for the worry that we're in the territory of Platonism, I think there's a really important question about what Platonism really means and what Plato is committed to. I don't think he's a dualist in the way that a lot of naturalists seem to assume. I think there's a lot of picture thinking going on, but there's a really important question of what that thinking is really trying to convey. Now, do, does all of that make sense so far? And please feel free to um, shake your head if I'm piling on far too much stuff at this stage because I would then stop and curtail what I'm saying and, and perhaps um, pause for a moment. So so would, would anybody, yeah, yeah. Um, I, Can we I have a know. question from yeah, Ian? Certainly. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I'm not familiar uh, with Iris and Herdock's work, I'm afraid to say, um, but does she give any evidence for her belief? I mean, you're articulating her belief quite clearly, but does she actually, is it just a belief of hers? Or does she, does she give any evidence for it? Is that something I mean, you I, can quickly comment on or should we save that yeah, for discussion, I mean, I Fiona? Think, I think that's a, a really good question. Um, she's certainly not claiming to prove this position. And I think we've moved beyond the idea that, you know, it's a matter of presenting positions and offering the best evidence for one position as opposed to another. So at a certain level, she's relying upon her intuitions, but she thinks that there, are real, there is a lot of evidence to support the kind of position that she takes seriously. And I think that she would say that the greatest piece of evidence is, you know, just looking around us and seeing, reflecting upon how we're motivated um, when in our dealings with other people and the way in which love is an important motive in all that we do. So I think that at one level you can, uh, I, I don't know, you, you, you can, reject the assumption that there's something deeply problematic in the position that she's putting forward and make it sound quite commonsensical. And, but by, you know, just playing down the supposedly spooky elements and getting a clearer sense of what's really an issue when we relate to others and when we think in moral terms. And certainly it will be problematic if you accept this value denuded conception of nature that so many naturalists take seriously. And then you'll be wanting to say, look, what is the evidence for this position? It seems to be deeply problematic if you accept this ontology. But she's wanting to, and I'm wanting to dislodge that kind of move or suggest that that kind of move rests upon a framework that is itself being called into question here, if that makes sense. What, was there anything else at this stage? I think Terry looked as if he was shaking his head, but um, I, I can't really see very much. Out of <laughs> I'm scanning through. Maybe post in the chat if you if you do want to button with a question because we're not able to see all the faces at once, so we might miss yeah. your gestures. Yeah, and and certainly do. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to skip a bit of the original paper and move to section three, um, where I try to introduce a way of thinking about God that narrows the distinction between Murdoch's true naturalism and my theistic naturalism, and which takes really seriously this idea that love has to be at the center of things. So there's a really important question here of how we're to think about the limits of love. I noticed the first cat has appeared on the screen and my cat has been locked out of the room. <laughs> 
So th this is the point of, of, of this um, section. So Murdoch's true naturalism poses a challenge to morally deficient forms of religion and theism. Um, and we can agree, as she wants to insist, that the conception of God as a supernatural being um, raises difficulties. Oh, just surprised at what's being said, okay. Um, okay, sorry, I'm not sure <laughs> think it would be strong. Carry on, I think, Fiona. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so what I want to do now um, is suggest a way of thinking about God, which narrows the gap between Murdoch's position, my position, and what you might take to be traditional theism. Okay, so let's begin with John Robinson, who wrote a popular book in 1963 called Honest to God, and he was interpreted as an atheist by many, but I think this be this is because a lot of his critics were buying into the kind of framework that he was wanting to transcend. Okay. So Robinson offers an accessible and eminently readable version of a position which has been defined with some complexity and depth by a range of German theologians, all of whom seek to transcend the kind of framework in which God and the world are to be dualistically opposed. So they're wanting to move beyond this two worlds framework that the typical naturalist thinks that you have to be committed to if you believe in God, if you're a theist. Okay, and it's assumed on this problematic framework that suspect supernaturalism, God as a supernatural entity and scientific naturalism are the only available options. Okay. So the implication here is that there is an alternative to the offending dualistic framework and that our understanding of God and the world must be modified accordingly. Robinson's take on this matter is that we have a challenge to the naturalist's insistence that God is simply a redundant name for nature or for humanity and an infinitely more satisfactory way of modeling God's transcendence. And um, there are a couple of quotations here from Robinson, who's quoting from Paul Tillich. Um, and he cites his claim that to call God transcendent in this sense does not mean that one must first establish a super world of divine objects. That would be the dualistic framework. It does mean that within itself, the finite world points beyond itself. In other words, it is self-transcendent. Now that's a really problematic, well, difficult to understand sort of claim. So I just wanna read it again. To call God transcendent does not mean that one must first establish a super world of divine objects. So to call God transcendent doesn't mean that God exists in some second supernatural realm that's transcendent of nature. It does mean that within itself, the finite world, i.e. the natural world, the only world there is, points beyond itself. In other words, it's self-transcendent. Now, Robinson takes this to be Tillich's great contribution to theology. And here's another quote. It involves the reinterpretation of transcendence in a way which preserves its reality while detaching it from the projection of supranaturalism which is Robinson's name for suspect supernaturalism, for that kind of dualistic framework. So the divine, as Tillich sees it, does not inhabit a transcendent world above nature. It is to be found in the ecstatic character of this world as its transcendent depth and ground. Okay. So I don't know how clear that is, but if I were to be with you and had a white, if I had a whiteboard with me, I would draw two circles on the board to represent the dualistic framework where one circle represents God, the other one represents nature. And I would draw for the framework that Tillich is trying to envisage here, one circle with a dot in the middle of it, 
or one circle with a smaller circle inside of it to make sense of the idea that on the second framework, we've got a one world position, but this world has infinite depths. It is supposed to be self transcendent in that sense. So we've rejected two world position and we've got a one world position, but this world has infinite depths, okay? Now, this position calls to mind, and I mean, I, I should just keep repeating that all of this stuff is so incredibly and infinitely complex and difficult that, um, you know, I've been trying to get my head around it for about 20 years, and I'm expecting everybody here to understand it within about 20 minutes. So it's really difficult. There are a lot of metaphors and pictures, and you're going to be struggling at this stage and we'll come back to all of that in questions. What I would want to say is that the position calls to mind Murdoch's true naturalism and Robinson likewise gives center stage to the concept of love, taking as his starting point Feuerbach's claim that the true atheist is not the man who denies God the subject, it is the man for whom the attributes of divinity, such as love, wisdom, and justice are nothing. He grants that this is very near to his own position insofar as his aim is to interpret theological statements as statements about human life. But this isn't, is not to be interpreted as a concession to atheism for the relevant attributes have, sorry, the relevant attributes of divinity, like love, for example, have their origin in God, God being the beyond in the midst, rather than existing in some second supernatural sense. So I'm sorry, this is starting to sound incredibly um, abstract. So Feuerbach says, as you know, that love is God, and that we should be saying that instead of saying that God is love. My theologian wants to be able to say both of these things. We can say that love is God, because love is a human attribute, something that we're capable of, but the love that we're capable of on this way of thinking has its origin in the infinite love of God. So that on this position, we can say both that love is God and that God is love. And you know, the question will be, can you really say both of these things? Is it not trying to argue for both in a kind of sly and deeply problematic way? Anyway, we have at least rejected the idea that God and the world are to be modelled on two externally related items between which there is an insurmountable divide. But, you know, I started talking about a beyond in our midst. What does that really mean? Well, it means for a start that we're capable of relating to God. But what kind of relation? Love is central to our protagonists, and Murdoch dreams of a time when its significance to moral philosophy will once more be acknowledged, as it was when Plato's influence was manifest. Murdoch's concerned with our relation to the good, and it's central to her position that we're eminently capable in this regard, albeit weighed down by our more tawdry, selfish aspects. Um, when Murdoch talks about egoism, it's her way of conceding to the notion of original sin, which is a way of conceding to the idea that moral failure is always um, possible for human beings. Moral failure is a, is a reality. So I'm gesturing towards a position which requires extensive thought and elucidation, and there are huge gaps in what I've said tonight, just for timekeeping reason. But what little I've said suggests that the structure of this position offers a way of avoiding a conjunctive conception of the God-world relation, so that you've got, you know, that dualistic picture, the two circles, nature on the one hand, God on the other, and no way of explaining how the two could relate. And I've said that this framework has much in common with Murdoch's true naturalism. According to this framework, we are immersed in a reality which transcends us. Love is central to this framework, and love is that by virtue of which we relate, however falteringly, to this infinite reality. The issue here 
concerns how we're to comprehend the nature and limits of love. And there's an advantage to setting up the issue in these terms, namely that the reality and significance of love is granted by all sides. I mean, this is another way of um, commenting and responding to your question, Ian, um, about how you might even begin to make a case for this kind of position. I think what, what I'm wanting to say here is that there is a way of thinking about this position that makes it into the most obvious sort of thing you could be saying here. You know, you say, well, we've got human beings in the picture, we've got the natural world, we've got this capacity that we have to reach out towards others and other things with love. And what more do you need? And yes, a certain kind of naturalist will come back at that point and say, that's all very well, it sounds really great, I can buy everything that you've said, but what about that really embarrassing God bit that you want to um, add on to the position? And what I'm wanting to say is that that is a real issue on certain ways of thinking about God, um, where you have this framework according to which you've got nature, love, human beings, they can all be characterized in atheistic terms. Working from within that framework, then if you come in at the last moment and say, now I want to add God to all of this, then the atheist is just gonna say, no, that's just ridiculous. You've already conceded that you don't need God. Whereas I wanting to destabilize those distinctions and say, look, it's not a matter of saying, this is what we can characterize of the world. And then there's a further question about whether we should bring God into the picture. It's rather, we begin with a concept that we can all agree is central to what it means to be human, love. And there are questions about the nature and limits of love, but let's begin with this starting point. And let's think of people like Feuerbach who use this kind of um, claim to distance himself from theism and to defend a kind of atheism in which love was at the center of things. So I want to say, yeah, that's all very important. Love is central to moral philosophy. We can agree with Iris Murdoch on that score, but maybe by making this kind of move and worrying about, a bit about the kind of dualistic framework to which the people with which I began are committed, we can allow that this kind of starting point is in fact compatible with a theistic starting point, simply because we've deconstructed and dismantled or at least questioned the framework which makes the question of God into a further question that's deeply problematic and irrelevant to anything that could be of remote interest to us human beings, given what's important to us. So that's what, what I'm wanting to do here. I'm trying to introduce a completely different framework in terms of which to introduce these issues and to try to be clear about what's of importance to us. Um, I'm not interested in the question of who's an atheist and who's a theist and what kind of conception of God we take seriously. I want to promote healthy dialogue um, between people who are all united in their interest in the question of what it means to be human and what it means to love. And then just raise a few questions about the limits of these concepts and suggest that these limits are not as obvious as a lot of people would have us assume. So that's really where I'm going to stop. And I hope that I hope that I haven't made the position sound as deeply as obscure as it might have sounded at a certain point. And um, but anyway, we've got a lot of time for questions and you can tell me how mad or spooky or mysterious or whatever it sounds. Thank you very much for being so patient and um, for listening. Thank you very much, Fiona. We could have a maybe not quite silent round of applause if some of us have unmuted. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand, which is the little uh, button you might be able to see somewhere. I'm not sure where it is even on my screen, but Robin's managed to raise his hand uh, yeah. or post something in the, the chat. And while people um, do that, I'll just... Yeah, kick off with a, a quick um, question, uh, Fiona. Um, 
you mentioned the you know, magnetic nature of the world, which uh, I think, as you characterized it, is uh, things we are drawn to, particularly morally speaking, within the world. And I, I wondered um, what role humans, as opposed to other sorts of animals, have, it, have in the world. Is the purpose for us in some way, or are we part of the purpose? Is that an important distinction you know you, you're talking about facts about us or facts about the world we're observing uh, the connections between the two or are any of those even important distinctions or do they do they all have the yeah. same answer I mean I think that you've raised a really important point and I would you know I've talked a lot about human beings but I would hate to make it sound as if my only concerns are anthropocentric concerns so I'm talking from the perspective of human values where those values are not simply values pertaining to what's um, of interest to human beings but values that concern things other than human beings like for example the environment or non-human animals and I mean it's funny I've just finished a paper on religion and the environment um, with the help of philosophers like Bernard Williams and David Wiggins, um, both of whom want to say that it's really important that we move beyond anthropocentrism. And um, I mean, both of them also want to operate within an atheistic framework as well. So the values in question are not limited to human values in that very, very narrow sense, but they are the values that are capable of appealing to and being appreciated by human beings because there's more of concern to us than um, other human beings and our interests and our utilities or pleasures or whatever. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Um, over to you, Robin. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes. That's great. Yeah. Uh, just a, a quick question, then a slightly longer question. <laughs> okay. So, so the quick question is, uh, is there a difference between this uh, lovely uh, concept of one worldism and monism? Yeah. Are there, are there similarities between that uh, philosophical concept? And do you want to answer that one first? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I would have to say that I'm not a monist in the sense that I do want to uphold a distinction between God and the world. Um, and I'm not a pantheist. Um, but I do think where, where the pantheist would involve reduction of God to nature. But I do think that these distinctions are really problematic. And if you take, for example, well, the most traditional pantheist um, Spinoza, he operates with a distinction between God and the world. And, you know, for him, God is conceived in and through itself and is substance properly so-called and to be distinguished from finite modes of substance like ourselves. So Spinoza operates with a distinction between God and the world. Spinoza can make, can make sense of the idea that the world was created. Um, a, an excellent book that spells out some of this is a book by Nancy Levine on Spinoza, I think it's called Spinoza's Revelation. So I'm really unclear about what the distinction is between pantheism, panentheism and theism. Um, and I want to make a distinction between God and the world in the sense that I'm not a pantheist. So yeah. I'm not a monist in, in that sense. Okay. Does, does that make sense? Yes, that, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, just be reading a bit of Spinoza, so I think I know what you're where you're getting at. Um, the, the second question, am I allowed, Nick? Yeah, just to- Yes, go for it, but that, do put your hand I, up other people if you'd like to ask yeah, one, but carry that, on. Then, I, then I'll shut up. Um, um, basically, I was really interested to hear you commenting about divinity as ecstasy. Is that correct? Or yeah. As, as a form of ecstasy, yeah? Yes. So as a, someone, hate to worry you, someone who's a little interested in moods and psychology, yeah? that obviously what goes with ecstasy um, and epiphanies and optimism and selfless love, uh, that's perhaps for me one, should we say, group of moods and experiences and feelings. And at the other end, you've got depression, skepticism, selfishness and hate. So for me, uh, dualism, as it were, a, a true duality in terms of a one-worldism is actually almost driven by mood, behavior, psychology, um, and the human mind, as it were. Um, how do you feel about uh, a sort of rationalist scientific 
type sort of as me, uh, who basically is agnostic. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not one way or the other. I, I like mm. to think of myself as balanced. But but seeing the duality uh, in terms of um, ecstasy versus agony. So, oh God, I mean that's so interesting. Um, I mean, when Tillich there is talking about ecstasy, he's um, trading upon the etymology of, of the Greek term ecstasis, nice. where it means a kind of moving outside of oneself. So love involves ecstasy in that sense. And in Iris Murdoch's sense, because, you know, when she talks about love and she's talking about erotic love, she says that um, when you fall in love, um, for the first time, suddenly something other than you is more important. And she talks of the way in which it falling in love pierces the egoistic um, shell that most of us are imprisoned in until we can somehow break beyond our egoism by love. So ecstasy in that sense is really important. Um, I, th I think I... I missed a bit of what you were saying when you were talking about duality. I mean, one thing that I would want to say is that on the dualistic framework, important distinctions are fudged, I think, because you've got an either or framework. And for example, a supernaturalist will reject, sorry, the naturalist, a certain kind of naturalist will reject supernaturalism and then will be left with a position um, that cannot accommodate certain really important distinctions that we might want to accommodate, like the distinction between science and value or something like that. But when you were talking about those distinctions, can you just remind me? Um, yeah, 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 surely. Um, the, 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 the duality, as opposed to supernatural versus naturalism, would be, for me, what's driving um, divinity i.e. I. Uh, a desire to believe in divinity, namely ecstasy, optimism, selflessness, oh, and okay. love, and love yeah. as opposed to the, shall we say, almost the evil side, the, the opposite side of human nature, mm. um, depression, skepticism, selfishness, and hate. So mm. what might be driving uh, a duality is in fact uh, a psychological phenomenon. Okay, but those psychological phenomena obviously have metaphysical significance, don't they, for certain frameworks? I mean, for somebody like Murdoch, for example, you've got our capacity to love, and then you've got sin, or original sin, as she understands it, yeah. um, which is egoism for her. And think, for example, of something that Rowan Williams said when he was trying to characterize hell. And he says that hell is being alone with my own selfish ego. For all yeah, yeah, yeah. And I really like that way of thinking about hell. Hell, you know, is, yeah. hell, hell is selfishness, yeah. In yeah, and hell, hell is self-inflicted and it's some a reality that you create within yourself. And yeah, so that makes perfect sense. But I mean, another reason why I found your questions and comments so interesting is that, I don't know, I was thinking today about the dark night of the soul and mm. the theological significance of it and the metaphysical significance of it. And this was in the context of thinking about nihilism and one characteristic way of understanding nihilism, which you're in a kind of nihilistic state when you have no desires at all and it's a kind of existential boredom, if you like, as, as, one, as one author was characterizing it. And it just made me think about how you're to understand the distinction between one, depression, two, the dark night of the soul, which is to be understood in religious terms, and then three, the state of nihilism, which is taken seriously by a lot of Nietzschean atheists and, Absol and these, absolutely absolutely and, and these themes are really important uh, i mean for the theme for the project that i'm working on at the moment so how interesting that you introduced them here but do you have any thoughts about that absolutely um i'm a great believer i i'm agnostic i i, I and um i'm a 
hopefully a scientist. I've got neuroscience background, psychology mm. background. Mm. Um, but for example, reading someone like Nietzsche um, or Sartre, you just see those dark moments and you just wonder what's driving them towards their, um, well, nihilism <laughs> and their, uh, their negativity when it comes to spirituality and metaphysicality. Thank you. I don't, I don't, want, like, to hold, um, I don't want to yeah. hold the questions. Thank, thank you, Robin. <laughs> thank, you, thank, you, um, thank you for sharing for, for us. Um, that was I've very got a few nice. Thank others. you. Thank, thank you. Um, I've got thank a few you. others waiting. Uh, Stephen, then Ian, then Simon. We seem to uh, be a, a bit short of women with questions, if any would like to uh, come in. But we'll go first to Stephen. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, thank yes. Thank you. Uh, Fiona, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I do find these talks quite difficult because I'm not uh, academically minded when it comes to philosophy and there's a lot of language I don't really understand. So could I just run past you what I think you're saying in simple mm. terms and see if it fits? Mm. I think it's pretty clear that we, uh, all of us, think within a box, if you like, which is defined by our life experiences and the indoctrination we've received from others, like our parents and teachers and people we've met along the road. Um, and it can be extremely difficult to communicate with others who've been indoctrinated in a different way. And I, I, I feel that perhaps you're trying to use the language of those who inhabit the dualist block to explain to them why they should think a little bit further, but it's left me a little bit confused. Um, is there really anything more uh, to what you're saying? Or, no, that's not the way to put it. Uh, are you really saying that basically we have learnt that um, a sense of the divine is a useful way to explain things that we didn't understand in times gone by uh, and as a way to improve society for everybody? Is that what you mean that it's self-transcendent, that we've we've invented it for ourselves and it's beneficial so we've kept it and it's just gone on living through generation and generation is, is that what it is put in simple terms i mean i i actually want to say something a bit different to that um i want to say that the standard claim and certainly amongst a lot of my contemporaries and colleagues and friends is that atheism is to be taken for granted and it's the only intellectually respectable position and you know I'm not coming at this issue by the way as a staunch theist I'm coming at it as someone who is genuinely quite unclear about what one should be saying in this context but somebody with a deep sense of the transcendence and an attraction to mysticism etc etc so I it, it's not as if I'm it, actually uh, yeah yeah so, so what I'm wanting to say is that um okay most people are atheists and most philosophers are atheists, but they are operating with a really problematic conception of God that involves this framework that I believe has been taken for granted and should not be taken for granted. Now, in saying all of this, I'm nicking quite a lot of ideas from Hegel and from some of the theologians that I mentioned. So what I'm saying is that the atheism that's so pervasive in our society, um, or at least in the Anglo-American world, perhaps not the American world actually, um, but at least in the, in the UK, um, there's, it involves a deeply problematic metaphysical framework. And once you diagnose that problem and that issue, then the question of whether we should be theists is wide open again. And that to me is deeply interesting. And I think like a lot of people, well, I was brought up as a Catholic. I went to church. I hated it. Luckily, by the age of about 15, I could stop going. It seemed to be completely irrelevant to anything that was remotely interesting to me. Then I started doing philosophy and I came across figures like Heidegger and Sartre and, and then eventually some theologians and realized that 
there are some deeply interesting questions here that I had not associated with the God question because I was, I suppose, I don't know whether the term indoctrination is fair, but I was educated into a way of thinking about God that forced me to be an atheist. And I'm now questioning that framework in the way that many people have questioned it. And I think that the question of God can be reopened in the light of that questioning of the framework. So I'm not saying that God is an in, I'm not saying that God is an invention at all. I'm saying that that kind of picture may well be forced upon you if you accept the framework that has been so pervasive. Thank you, Fiona. I want yep. to um, come much. to uh, Ian next. Oh, hello, Fiona. Thanks very much for the talk. Quite fascinating. Um, if I had a whiteboard. I'd be drawing three circles on it. Uh -huh. So I'm, a, I'm not a dualist, I'm a, what is it, a triathlist, I'm not sure. But, um, and they would overlap. Yes. Uh, and they're three very distinct worlds with completely different feels to them, uh, a different vocabulary and so on. And one is the material world, that we're all familiar with. Um, the other one is the subjective personal world of, of your own personal experience, which is unique to yourself and is in a way much realer than the so-called real world, the material world. And that's a really very important second category, if you like. It's related to the, uh, to the first because it depends on it for our brains and so on. And then the third world is a shared one uh, among in humanity, which is a world of concepts uh, supported by language and symbols and all the rest. And these concepts include things like the moon or a lion it also includes concepts which point to the real world, to the material world. So there is a reference. It also includes concepts like Father Christmas and unicorns. They're real. They're real in this conceptual world. Everybody understands what they are. But they don't refer to anything in the actual physical world or material world. No. Um, and, and there are things like Pan and Zeus and the Christian God, mm. which are in this conceptual world. It's a big question, do they point to anything in the material world? But there are other things in this conceptual world, like love and hate, uh, which point to things in the mental, in the experiential world, the subjective world. Love doesn't exist in the material world. It exists in the subjective world, between shared between human beings. So you've got these three different worlds, um, each dependent upon one another, pointing to one another, in some respects, but there are gaps, like unicorns who don't point to anything, possibly a Christian God, I don't know. So my question is, where, and I, it seems to me as if you're creating a new concept of God, which isn't the Christian God, the one I learned about also as a Catholic, I know the, uh, the Catechism definition, um, but a different one, which almost you could call love, the shared experience of love. And that then points to the shared experience. And that doesn't exist in the material world, it exists in our um, psychological world, our, our, our subjective world. Does this make any sense at all? Of course, it makes a lot of sense. And this is really interesting. I mean, first of all, I'd say that, I mean, love does exist in the material world in the sense that we're material beings who are capable of loving. So I think that that's quite important, but, but that's a minor point, really. I think one really interesting point that you've raised in all of this, which can allow me to go back to that stuff about dualism, is how we're to think about concepts. Now, in philosophy, there are two prevalent models, which are going to, and, and I think if I just spell out these models, it might be a helpful way of taking us back to some of the central themes. So one model is the Kantian model, um, which is the cookie cutter model, as I think Hilary Putnam put it, philosopher Hilary Putnam. And on this model are concepts. So, sorry, on this model, reality is like a lump of raw pastry. And when we conceptualize it, it's like what you do when you take a cookie cutter and cut shapes into the pastry. So that the things we conceptualize are not really there in reality, which is the lump of raw pastry. We construct things into existence on this way of thinking. Now for Kant, um, Kant made a distinction between things in themselves and 
um, things as they must appear to us. Um, sorry, my screen has changed, so I just see where you are. Yeah. Um, and and it, at the realm of things in themselves, um, Kant would, um, God, for example, and it's built into his kind of framework that there are certain things that are unknowable to us and we cannot know the nature of God. And there's a question of how to interpret Kant's metaphysical framework, but it seems clear that at one level at least, he seems to think that the things that we conceptualize when, for example, we talk about things and causation, for example, are constructions of consciousness in one sense, concepts of subjective forms that we impose upon reality. Now, if you accept that model, then if you accept it across the board, then you'll say, you know, the concept of God is just one more construction along with everything else. Or you might say, maybe this model works for some concepts and not others, like maybe concepts like unicorn, maybe concepts like God or the Christian God. Now, the other is that, is that cookie cutter model, that's quite clear, is it, as a model of concepts? It's accepted by Nietzsche in his early work. And he wanted to say that, you know, whenever we conceptualize anything at all, we distort it. We're basically talking about ourselves. And it's this kind of model that is behind an objection that you get in quite a lot of continental philosophy, that there's something really problematic and egoistic about cognition. It doesn't tell us what things are like in themselves. It tells us about how we interpret things. And those interpre interpretations say more about us than about the things we're trying to interpret. Now, the other model of concepts is the fishnet model, which is like this. Um, the world is like the ocean full of fish. And when we conceptualize, um, what we're doing is something akin to what the fisherman does when he takes his net and pulls out some fish from the ocean. On this model, the fish are there anyway when we get them in our nets. So it's not as if we construct the fish into existence, like on the cookie cutter model, the fish are there anyway. Now, that model of concepts um, is taken very seriously by the kind of realist who thinks that when we talk about causation and individual substances um, like cats and dogs and human beings, we're talking about things that are there anyway. We don't construct these things into existence. Now, we've got those two models. Um, I find the Kantian model problematic. A lot of people find that model problematic. Um, but the question is, well, what happens to the case of God and the concept of God, um, to go back to the question? Now, I think that this question is not easily answered. You know, if you say, OK, take God. And when we conceptualize God, are we like the fisherman or are we like the cook um, with the cookie cutter? And you might even complicate the issue even more by saying, OK, are there certain conceptions of God that are to be aligned more properly with the cookie cutter metaphor or with the fishnet metaphor? And maybe the question that I'm trying to respond to is asking that in one way. We've got the Christian conception of God. We've got this conception of God as love. Um, are they different? Is one more accurate than the other? I mean, what I'd say in response to that question is the idea of God as love is the most traditional and the most Catholic of any way of thinking about God. You know, think about the encyclical by um, Pope Benedict, Deus Caritas Est, God is love, which was a way of spelling out this conception of God. Um, so that would be one way of addressing the question. Um, but going back to the question of which model of concepts we should be using either across the board or um, as an understanding of, sorry, either across the board, I'm getting a bit tired at this point, either across the board or with relation to the question of how we should be thinking about God, um, I guess I would want to say it's the fishnet metaphor, but I'm not in the business of constructing proofs either way. I'm just wanting to say that I think that there are quite good reasons for taking this position seriously and by beginning with our capacity to love, 
and moving beyond that starting point in the way that this alternative framework allows you to do. That's that's what I would say. Thank but you. But that's a ridiculously long mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> a really interesting question. We'll, we'll give you a break. I, I think we're getting close to the end, but we did have one more uh, question from Simon, and then maybe we'll draw things to a close. Over to you, Simon. You'll need to unmute. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much for all of that. Um, I find it very interesting. I don't pretend to understand it all, but my question really follows on from both Stephen's question and your discussion just now. And it's all around, maybe it's a meta question in a sense, because it, I'm trying to understand where you put your model in, uh, in the ontology of it. It's, um, do you, are you, do you think you've said something which is in some way an objective truth? And uh, a statement about God perhaps should be, if you can say it this way, it's not scientific truth, but, it, but most people, most theologians would see God, I think, as a, a, something objective. Or are you, would you cast it more as that this is for where we are in our current thoughts and develop, uh, thoughts and culture, a useful co set of concepts with which to view the world? Or is it something in between the two? I mean, I obviously want to allow that because we're limited, fallible beings, um, whenever we make claims to knowledge, it can turn out that um, we were wrong to suppose that we knew what we claimed to know. And, you know, that applies to science and to any form of discourse so that I would have to yeah. accept my fallibility in that respect. But I am putting forward a position that claims to, well, it involves a, an ontology um, because I'm talking about God and it involves a, a truth, a religious truth, if it is a truth. But of course, I'm not saying that I can know that but I'm wanting to say that some of the reasons for doubting this possibility and doubting the possibility of um, putting forward or articulating this kind of truth can be um, called into question, really. It's not just a set of useful concepts. No, no, and I would just see that kind of move and the kind of anti-realism that you get um, from people like Don Cupid in, in the religious field as operating within that problematic framework. You know, this is what objective truth would look like. Um, we can't have that, so we have to resort to something less than truth, like, oh, it's just what we're talking about, or it's a form of pragmatism or something like that. I, th I think that that's just throwing the baby out with a bath water and is a concession to the framework we should be avoiding. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. I think we're through the questions. If I mean, can, can, I just, can, can I just yes. say one other thing, which is that if Please. anybody does have a question that wasn't covered, um, you're certainly welcome to email me. And um, the, the discussion has, here has been so interesting and helpful. I'd quite like to be in contact with some people about some of these issues if that's what you wanted and if there are, are any written questions that I haven't seen and you want to send to me then that's absolutely fine as well Nick. Definitely well yeah please do I think um, Fiona if you're happy for me to share your um, email address I think you put it in the handout yeah. which suggests you <laughs> suggests you are unless that was a mistake I can do that. Um, I'm just posting the title of our next talk as well, which We've is got Julian coming. That's that's good. Julian, uh, and a, maybe a different perspective, but some, some elements no, he's, in common. He's really interesting and and, uh, and and sympathetic to a lot of this stuff, but obviously operating within an atheistic framework. Um, so for those who haven't found the chat window yet, it's um, Julian Bagini on was Jesus a great moral philosopher? Um, so we will circulate some more details about that, but hopefully you can see some connections to, to the previous talks. Um, and we're, we're coming to the end, so thank you very, very much, Fiona, for giving uh, us your time and sharing some ideas and walking us gently through <laughs> some of them, as you say, it's okay. a, a tricky area. Um, I did send out the journal, and I believe I've managed to share the, the handout um, in the chat. Uh, so you can have a, a read through that.
and we really appreciate the offer to let us get in touch with more questions. Uh, for my part, I will uh, attempt to get the recording up on, on YouTube with the discussion. Um, so I'll share the link to that if I am successful. And thanks to everyone for, for coming along. Really appreciate uh, the discussion and your continued participation. Thanks, and everyone. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you.